Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 15. I'm going to wrap up this series, What Would Jesus Say? Just to let you know what's coming down the pike, two weeks from today, I'm starting a brand new series called Woke or Awake. And we're going to address the issues of the church and how we need revival in the church to bring us back to true doctrine, biblical doctrine, rather than being invaded by the Marxist theology that is infiltrating so many churches today and turning people away from God rather than toward Him. Invite your friends and family. I assure you it'll be controversial, but it'll be biblical, scriptural, anointed, inspired by the Holy Ghost. So plan to be here and bring someone with you, especially someone who may be confused about how to navigate spiritual life in this day and in this age. John chapter 15, we're going to read it in just a second. Already in this series, we've talked about the fact that Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He also went on to say, I am the light of the world, and his light pushes out all darkness. Last week, we talked about the fact that he is the door to the sheepfold. He also said, I am the good shepherd in that same chapter. When we combine that with what he said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life, we understand there's only one way to the Father, and that's through his Son, Jesus Christ. All others, he said, are thieves and robbers. That's his words, not mine. And then today we're going to talk about the fact that he said, I am the vine. John 15, we're going to read this in segments. We'll read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll drop down through the text a little more. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Father, we pray now for the anointing of the Spirit of God to open hearts and open minds. Allow your word to find good soil and bring drastic, revolutionary change into our hearts and into our lives today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we're talking about Jesus and his seven I Am statements of the book of John, we recognize they were all designed to reveal him as God. Jesus is not just born of a virgin as a man. But he also is God. He said he laid down all the attributes of the Godhead so he could identify with you and me. Yet he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. It's an amazing thing that our Savior isn't just a man who died. Our Savior was fully God, fully man. He did die, but he rose again on the third day. You can check it out. You'll find that Muhammad is buried in Saudi Arabia. You can find where Buddha was buried. You can find where every other modern religion finds its roots and find their leader buried and dead. But you will never find where Jesus Christ lies today. Because he is no longer dead, he is alive. He said, I am he which was alive and was dead and now am alive forevermore. So we're talking about the fact today he is the vine and all life flows from the vine. He said, my father is the vine dresser. I am the vine and you're the branches. We need to understand that it's through the vine that we receive all aspects of life. Matter of fact, Peter said it this way, everything pertaining to life and godliness comes through him. It's already been laid out for us. Our role and our responsibility is to stay attached to the vine. And when we're attached to the vine, life flows through us. And he goes on to say in verse 2, if we don't bear fruit, he cuts us off. And if we do bear fruit, he prunes us so we bear more fruit. Now, I don't know about you, but the pruning process isn't always pleasant. It isn't always easy. It isn't always comfortable, but it's always worth it. When we allow God to do his work in and through our lives to make us more godly every single day. You know, when we, when we think about how this relates to the modern church, we see that today there's a huge worship movement going on. And people just want to listen to worship music 24-7. We want to worship, worship, worship. 
I'm not knocking worship music. I'm not knocking worship. We all need to worship. But as I told you last week, it's not about you. It's about him. And if you come to a service and say, Tom didn't sing the right songs or push the right buttons, you're making it about you. See, when all we do is focus on worship, you know what we, you know what we create? We create immature believers who the first time a storm comes can't stand, but they fade away. They fall, they falter. And then we have the other people that say, all I want is the word. Just give me the word, the word, the word. Listen, if all we do is focus on the word, we often produce arrogant believers. The balance is where we need to be. A balance of both worship and word. What we recognize as we lift our praise and our worship to him, he inhabits that. He dwells among us. He takes a chair and sets down right in the middle of us. And then when his word is spoken, there is spirit and there is life. We need both. We can't be one-sided or lopsided, you might say. When you read the scripture, looking on down through the next couple of verses, John 15, 3 says, you're already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you. I want to stop and talk about that word abide for just a second. The word abide means more than just a drive-by on Sunday morning. It means more than just coming to small groups on Sunday night. Listen, you can come at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, stay till noon. You can come at 7 on Wednesday night, stay till 8. But it's still not enough for you to abide. Abide means to stay, to dwell, to take up residence. Abide means that he is your source, your supply, and the focus of your entire attention. Abide means to be present with him at all times. It means extravagant time spent with the Lord. And may I tell you, your morning five-minute devotional on you verse isn't going to cut it. That's not abiding. It's not abiding. Listen, you can listen to every preacher on podcast in the world, come to every service you can possibly come to, and you're still not abiding. What happens when we allow our Christianity to be defined in those terms? This is what happens. We're doing nothing more than hijacking what the person speaking has been abiding in. We're trying to make it ours. It doesn't work that way. You and I have to learn to abide with him. You can do it a multitude of ways. You can do it driving down the road in your car. You can do it when you're on your walk or your run. Although why you would run, I've never figured out. It just makes no sense to me. I don't run unless I'm chasing something or somebody's chasing me. That's it. That's the limit. You can do it wherever you may be, letting your mind be centered on the Word of God and the presence of God, abiding in Him. It's not a drive-by relationship. It's a come-in-and-sit-down relationship. It means we spend extravagant time with the master, with the father. We can't get enough of him. And the more we get, the more we want, we abide. And when we fail to abide, it creates bad ideology. We'll use that word first, ideology. And then our ideology is influenced by the culture. Our ideology is influenced by the media. Our ideology is influenced by your social media influencers, which I still don't understand that. Get a job. It wouldn't that be just get a job. Go to work. Social media influencers. I'm speaking about my generation, obviously. And that bad ideology leads to kindergarten theology. We don't even understand the goodness of God or how great and wonderful God really is because we never abide in Him. Rather, we chase the latest fad or the latest preacher or the latest thing that's connected to the gospel. Can I tell you something? You can be baptized so many times that tadpoles know your name, but if you don't come up out of that water attached to the vine, it's of no value. Baptism does not save you. It says, I'm connected to the vine. I am one of his. I am a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. The church isn't here to make converts. We're here to make disciples. People who are tuned in, locked down, 
on the vine and being attached to him every single day. Anytime we fail to abide, then the lives of Satan seem plausible. Anytime we fail to abide, the lives of Satan seem plausible. It's okay to get an abortion. You don't want to ruin your life with a child. It's convenient. It's easy. Just go do it. The lives of Satan become plausible. There's nothing wrong with smoking weed. The lives of Satan become plausible. When we understand that we don't abide, then we open ourselves up to everything that comes down the pike that is not of God and not from his word. I know I'm probably going to get in big trouble right now, but I've got to say it. There are groups in our culture that are devised by Satan, propelled by Satan, driven by Satan, and their only goal is to separate men and women from the truth of the living God. You say, well, who are some of those groups? Well, let me just throw one out at you and see if you'll still clap. How about BLM? Black lives do matter, but that doesn't get you where you need to go. When hundreds of millions of dollars are raised and very little goes back to the black community, it's not about black lives matter. It's about those at the top and their lives matter. Infiltrated with Marxist doctrine, supporting terrorism throughout the Middle East. Come on, folks, it's time to wake up, not be woke. I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I, by two weeks. See, when we, when we believe the lies of Satan, then we believe that there are different rules for different folks. That those rules can change depending on your social economic status, depending upon your heritage, depending upon the color of your skin. Well, I've got news for you. When you abide in the vine, you no longer see color. You're not worried about class. You're not dividing people by their economic status. But you understand at the cross, we all are on common ground. And it doesn't matter your name, your heritage, your language, lineage. We're all on common ground. When we abide in him. Let me poke the bear a little more. When we abide in him, we don't buy cancel culture. We don't go down that road. Just because something, someone says something that you disagree with doesn't mean they're wrong and you should cancel them. Matter of fact, if our first response is to cancel them, maybe we're the one that's wrong. Maybe we're the one that's not doing what we should be doing and behaving as we should be behaving and believing what we should be believing. One of the biggest lies in culture right now is the transgender movement. May I tell you that is devised in the pit of hell, it is promoted by Satan himself and every henchman that he has. It's designed, it's powered by a spirit of the Antichrist to pull people away from the truth of God's word. I told you a couple weeks ago, if you say you're not the right gender, you're in the wrong body, you're saying God made a mistake. And the last time I checked, there's not a one of you that are greater than God or me. See, we need to understand that we can go to the doctor and we can get cut up. We can go down to the dress shop and we can get dressed up. We can go over to Merle Norman and we can get made up. We can go down to the hood and we can get drugged up. But at the end of the day, all you're going to be is a man who is drugged up, made up, dressed up, cut up. You're still a man or a woman. There are no other genders. Come on, it's time for the church to stand up against this lie. God's looking for some people with backbone who say, we're tired of the milk toast gospel that doesn't change me, let alone anybody else. Give me the word. Let the word change lives. The sad part about it is this movement is coming for your children, for our kids. I thought about it yesterday when I was sitting around that table with nine of her grandkids. We have ten. We saw the oldest, Connor, on Friday, but he couldn't come yesterday. He's playing basketball at Oklahoma State and they were practicing. So all the other nine, and I'm thinking, what would this old redneck do if their school allowed a boy to go into the girls' bathroom? I've already told you what this old redneck would do in this church. 
I always carry a sharp knife. So we've got to come to the place where we're not afraid of the backlash. We're not afraid of somebody disagreeing with us. Come on, I welcome debate. Try to prove to me your stance and your theory, and we will show it's wrong by the Word of God every single time. When we believe the lies of culture, we follow a, and listen to this, man you factured. Man you factured Jesus. A Jesus who is whoever we want him to be. A Jesus who's all love and butterflies and warm kisses. We follow a Jesus that is man you factured. We follow a Jesus where there is no cost, where there is no commitment, where there is no call on our lives. A Jesus that lets us do as we please, whatever suits seems right to us, it's all okay. But that's not what the real Jesus said. The real Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. The real Jesus said, you have to give to gain. You have to lose to win. You have to die to live. That's what the real Jesus says. And you know why we fall for those lies? Because we don't know the book. We don't know the word. And when we don't know the word, anything becomes plausible in our minds. Do you realize that according to a recent survey, 39% of Christianity worldwide, 39% does not believe in hell? That's interesting. Because I thought I got saved so I didn't have to spend eternity in hell. I thought that was the point of salvation, that I could confess my sins and he would come to life and forgive me of my sins and change my destiny and change my direction and give me a home in heaven. 39% of Christianity doesn't even believe in hell. What do you think happens to someone who dies without knowing Jesus? This is where it gets real interesting. They believe it's just kind of a poof and you're gone. Just disappear. Folks, I've got news for you. Every one of us will live forever. The question is where? It's location, location, location. Will you live in heaven with God or will you live in hell with Satan and his devils? There are only two choices, like there's only two genders. This thing is way simpler than we have made it. There are people who believe that all truth is relative. It's my truth, it's your truth. No, friend, it's his truth. His truth is absolute. His truth is inspired. You know what the word inspired means? It means God breathed. We have this book because God breathed upon holy men of old. And as he breathed upon him, they inspired and transcribed the scripture. So when you and I might have it today, it's infallible. Infallible means without error. Without error. It's time for the church to recognize again, there are absolutes. There is truth. It's based on Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And his truth is authoritative. That simply means that what it says is what's going to happen. You don't have to wonder, you don't have to question, you don't have to worry. If he said it, it's going to occur. We have to understand that. And then he said, I'm the vine. I'm the source of life. I'm the sustenance for the branches. And a branch cannot survive, let alone bear fruit, detached from the vine. Not going to happen. Absolutely impossible. It's impossible in nature, and it's impossible in the kingdom of God. And you and I as believers cannot thrive spiritually unless we are attached to the vine. Unless his love flows through us, his power flows through us every single day. Look with me to verses 4 and 5 of our text. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Talked to some young people a couple weeks ago about the judgments. 
there's a judgment of the sheep and the goats where they're separated. The goats are those who name his name but are not attached to the vine, do not abide in him. It's only the sheep that are attached to the vine and find life flowing through him. He goes on to say, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Wow, what an indictment against the self-help gospel. What an indictment against the prosperity gospel. What an indictment against so much falsehood that has been perpetrated in the name of the church over the last 30 or 40 years. Without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. See, it's not say it and see it. It isn't name it and claim it. It's not profess it and watch it occur. I'm a faith preacher. I believe in faith. I live by faith. But I also know I serve a sovereign God that man makes his plans, but God directs his steps. We've got to come back to the point where it's not what I say. It's not what I think. It's not what I confess. It's what he wills in my life. He is a sovereign God. Do you know how many people have been disillusioned, turned away from the church because they tried this nonsense and they found it just doesn't work? You know why? Because it doesn't work. You know what works? The truth of the gospel works. Being attached to the vine, that's what works. Receiving life from him, that's what works. Verse 6, look at it with me. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Makes you wonder how these liberal theologians deal with verses like that. You know how they deal with them? They ignore them. Pass them over. Never talk about it. Never read it. Because it doesn't fit their perverted, twisted theology. If anyone does not abide in me, is cast out as a branch and is withered, They gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. What causes someone who was once attached to the vine to wither and die? Let me give you a few things that cause that. Paul wrote it this way to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Demas hath forsaken me. Listen to this phrase. Because he loved this present world. Another translation says, he loves the things of life. See, until you come to the place where you love God more than to love your home, your car, your family, your 401k, your job, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, you will wither and die on that vine. You've got to love him above all else. Demas forsook me because he loved the pleasures of life. Hebrews eleven twenty four five. 5, when the writer of Hebrews was talking about Moses, he said he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than join the pleasures of sin for a season. May I tell you, sin is pleasurable. Oh, it can be a lot of fun. It can feel real, real, real good. But one day you have to pay the piper. One day those accounts come due. One day you have to answer for the life you've chosen to live. And I'm not talking about eternal judgment. I'm talking about in this life, here and now. Every decision has a consequence. Every action has a consequence. And we have to understand that, yeah, it feels good right now, but it may be pretty ugly a year from now or 10 years from now. I'm going to talk to you guys this morning. I want you to hear me. It's time that young people today began to realize what my generation never got. And what my generation never got was that premarital sex was wrong, out of line, against the Scripture. My generation said everything's okay. Love whoever you want, whenever you want. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible tells you to be abstinent, to protect your body, to savor that gift from God, and only give it to the one you're going to marry. You say, well, it's too late for me. No, it's not. Because he says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all 
unrighteousness. It's not too late. All you've got to do is bow and confess and allow him to wash you clean and he will make you like you're new again. One more word for you. Don't date someone you're not willing to marry. That's a trap of the devil. You start chasing people because they're good looking or pretty or they have some money or the right car or the right clothes or the right name. You're going to be disappointed. Never date someone you won't marry. Well, how do I know that until I date them? Well, duh. Did you ever think about praying? Did you ever think about asking God? Try it. It works. It really does. It'll keep you out of hot water. You don't need to have seven broken relationships before you find the one. You can seek God. He'll show you the one. He'll lead you to that person. And in that waiting space, he'll give you patience, he'll give you perseverance, he'll give you strength, he'll make you a man or a woman of God who will not be easily beset by those easy sins. Oh, why not? If you're not willing to marry him, stay out of the car. If you're not willing to marry him, get out of the bedroom. When Mindy, my oldest daughter, was dating, never forget the first time her boyfriend came to the house. She was 16, he was probably 17, I don't know. Nice kid. I knew him, he played basketball with my son, I knew him. But when he came, I wanted him to understand there's some requirements if you're going to date my daughter. You're going to tell me where you're going, when you're going to get there, how long you're going to spend, and when you're bringing her home. And if I need to, I'm going to follow you to make sure you do exactly what you tell me you're doing. And if you don't do what you tell me you're doing, I'm going to yank her out of the car and bring her home myself. Parents, you have a responsibility to safeguard your children. Listen, I'm telling you, there is no 16-year-old who is mature enough to make the right decisions all the time. Sorry, guys, but your brain isn't fully developed until you're 25. That's a, that's a fact. That's a fact. Some of you are making decisions based on half a brain. You need to quit that. If you need help with that, come and see me. I can straighten you out. You won't get any more brain power, but at least you'll get a wise counsel. Come on, church. I'm having fun with this. But we need to understand if we're in the vine, these things fall away. What we place importance upon are not what we feel but the things that we know. I love it when somebody says to me, well, you know, I didn't want to do that, but the devil made me do it, or God put him in my pathway. You're an idiot. James 1, 13 through 15, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Listen, here's the rub. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires, the King James says lust, and enticed. Then when desire or lust has conceived, it births sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. God didn't put you in that place. You put yourself in that place. You say, well, there's nothing wrong with it. It may seem very innocent. But the chances... Of a young woman become pregnant out of wedlock as a teenager are much, much higher when there are no boundaries, no borders, no fences around their life. The guy say, yeah, but that's her. Dude, you're responsible for the rest of your life for that child. It's going to cost you time, effort, money, energy, and you're not ready for that. And again, if you're already there, don't throw up your hands in despair. But thank God that he's willing to forgive, to renew, to restore, to make a better way for you. Even from your sin, he brings victory. He doesn't leave us just to stew in our own failures. Someone says, well, you know, I'm the way I am because of my mother. No, you're not. You're the way you are because of you. 
You may not have had the best parent in the world. I didn't have the best parents in the world. But the bad decisions I made were not their fault. They were my fault. So stop blaming somebody else. Take personal responsibility and say it's my fault. I'm the one who needs forgiveness, deliverance, and help. Verses 7 and 8 tell us that we will bear much fruit. Bear much fruit when we abide in Him. You know what it tells me? It tells me that when we come to Christ, we're not new and improved versions of who we are or who we were. Rather, Tom, will you come back? It says in 1 Corinthians 5, 17, any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So when we come to Him, we're reborn. We're renewed, we're recreated by the power of the Spirit of God. So the man I once was is not the man I am today. The person you once were when you come to Christ is not the person you are today. Galatians 5.22 gives us the thank you, gives us the proof of his fruit. Says it this way, for the fruit of the Spirit is. This is what Jesus is talking about. When he's talking about, will bear much fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such there is no law. So that's what we're supposed to be developing when we're attached to the vine. But when we don't love each other or love God, we're not attached. When we don't live in joy, we're not attached. When we don't walk in peace, we're not attached. These things are developed in our life every single moment of every single day. Long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I don't have time this morning to go through all of that, but the notes for this outline are on the app. All the scriptures are there. You can read them and look them up and apply them as they need to be applied into your life see when we're attached to the vine we find strength to endure the harshest storm when we're attached to the vine we find peace that endures in the middle of the greatest chaos when we're attached to the vine we find a joy that is unsurpassable in our lives when we're attached to the vine there is hope that tomorrow won't look like today. That my present temporary circumstance will not be my future permanent circumstance. There's hope in Jesus Christ. G.I. Packer said it this way, once you become aware that the main business you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place. When we understand he's the vine, I got to be attached to know him. Most of life's problems fall in place. So very quickly, how do we abide? How do we abide in the vine? Number one is through prayer, talking to God. You don't have to have a prayer book. Talk to him like you're talking to me or a friend or a family member. God is not put off by a lack of religious dialect. Matter of fact, I think he condemns that, if I remember correctly. Don't pray like the hypocrites do in a public place in a loud voice for everybody to hear you. He said, don't do that. Shut yourself in your closet and pray where only the Father who hears in secret will then reward you openly through prayer. We present our needs, our concerns, our desires to him. We worship him, we magnify him. And then through his word, we abide in the vine. I'm going to say it again. It's not enough to get a little bitty thimble of gospel when you come to church on Sunday. You need to be in the Bible every day. Let the words of life spark life in you. See, as we read, as we meditate, as we memorize God's word, life and power begin to flow through us. And we're transformed by its truth through God's Word that our faith grows. It's by God's Word that we understand truth from error. It's because of God's Word we can say, Your Word I've hid in my heart so I might not sin 
against you. There is hope in God's Word. Hope in His Word. The other thing I want to tell you about being in the vine is that this thing about the Christian life, it's not a hundred yard dash. It's a marathon. And you have to live it and run it every single day of your life. You have to get up every morning and say, today I'm going to be attached to the vine. I'm going to receive life from Jesus Christ. Today, His light's going to flow through me. Today, He's going to be give me words that are bread of life for somebody that's dying. Today, I'm going to be able to show someone the door to the sheepfold and introduce them to the good shepherd. Every single day, we make those decisions and determinations. We're in this for the long haul. We're in it for eternity and eternity's sake. Paul read it this way to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you know that those who run in a race all run? but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. Therefore I run, not with uncertainty. I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I I discipline my body. Bring it into subjection, at least when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Stand to your feet with me. Haley, get ready to sing that song. Across this room today, as Haley begins to sing, and she's going to sing this song, Thank You Jesus for the Blood. As she begins to sing, if you need to attach to the vine. Maybe one time you were there, but you allowed the pleasures of life to pull you away. You allowed some lie to take you away. Or maybe you've never been attached. You never asked Christ to forgive you of your sins and come into your life. Then today is your day. So as Haley begins to sing this beautiful song, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. You need to be attached to the vine. I want you to step out and come. Stand across this altar. And let's let God do a deep work in your hearts and in your life. Sing it out, Haley. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 10.30 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.